The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus told the disciples a parable about their... Is that the right one? <laughs> okay. About, let me start over again. It's been a long couple of days. Jesus told the disciples a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had any respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming to me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I want to start uh, on behalf of Daniel and Susan, my children, and myself, and Jenny, uh, for all of those from St. John's who uh, helped so much to make yesterday's Requiem really very wonderful. Um, it was uh, very moving to see so many people from the Church of the Redeemer Kenmore, including the rector, showed up, and it was, but it was a good, it was good, and uh, I, but I appreciate all the hard work and the help that made it possible, so thank you very, very much from us. Um, I think, as by now everyone knows, we will be leaving on Friday um, to go to South Haven, Michigan, which was Ginny's hometown. Uh, and on Saturday, we will inter her remains there. And uh, that will be after two and a half years closure. I am really grateful for the opportunity to preach for two consecutive Sundays. Um, I'm especially thankful to have two readings from the prophet Jeremiah. I really like Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah was chosen by God to be God's voice to the children of Israel, exile, exiled in Babylon, captives of the Babylonian Empire. God's mission for Jeremiah was to be God's human voice, explaining to the Israelites not only why they had been exiled, but also God's promises for their return to Palestine and a new covenant with God for them. In this morning's reading from Jeremiah, or God through Jeremiah tells the captive people that a new covenant with God is being readied for them. He says, I will make a new, and this is God speaking. Um, I mean, it's Jeremiah speaking, but it's God saying what Jeremiah is going to say. I will make a new covenant. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my law within them and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. It's an incredible change. This, this covenant that's announced is an incredible change from what 
the children of Israel are used to, which is that a legalistic kind of covenant where, you know, I'm going to do this for you and you have to do this for me. And if you don't do this for me, then I will punish you. This one is that somehow I will come into you and you will come to know me deeply and personally. From the greatest people to the, to the most humble people. Well, powerful stuff. In fact, so powerful that it, the covenant comes to fruition because of full reality, and becomes a full reality in the death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice seals this promised covenant for all humanity. In other words, what Jesus accomplishes on the cross is exactly what God promised the Israelites in captivity. And we're the, also the beneficiaries of that. The core reality of this new covenant is a new soul-deep, indwelling relationship with God, the Holy Trinity, given to us in our day in the sacrament of holy baptism through which God, the Holy Spirit, comes to indwell us and unites us to God forever. It needs to be repeated over and over and over again in our time that what baptism does is create an indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in us. We are incarnations of God. What? Me? <laughs> I didn't ask for that. <laughs> but it's the truth. You see, it's what the church from its very first principles taught that there was this miraculous thing that happened with that water and that oil and those words. In this morning's gospel reading, according to Luke, Jesus tells the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. In this parable, Jesus says, will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to God day and night, the poor, the marginalized, the homeless, the abused, prisoners, on and on and on. When they cry day and night to God, will God make them wait? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. In the prophecy of Amos, there is a promise which is used famously by Martin Luther King, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Justice is the way that agape, God's redemptive, reconciling love, is made universally present and active in the world and all of humanity. Justice is the way that agape is made universally present and active. Justice, justice. In almost 50 years of my ministry as a priest, many people in parishes I have served have confronted me with the accusation that efforts by the church to enable justice to roll down like waters is just politics and not the business of the church. The church is supposed to be about spiritual things. Doesn't get any more spiritual than this. Actually, that accusation doesn't represent the true reality of the church's mission and ministry. The Book of Common Prayer Catechism states that the mission of the church is, quote, to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. That's the mission of the church, to restore all people to unity with God in Christ. In the baptismal covenant, which we renew several times a year, we vow and promise that God will strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. We promise, we vow, 
that we will strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. Through Jeremiah, God promises a new covenant. This covenant comes to fruition and becomes full in the death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice seals this promised covenant. You know, four times a year at least, we vow to do this. We all stand here and say we will with God's help. I think maybe in a lot of people are like me that we forget that that's a vow. We forget that in that vow, we obligate ourselves. We obligate ourselves to do those things so that justice can pour down like water, so that the, the poor hear the voice of God and act as God asks them to do. We vow to undertake this mission by striving for justice and peace among all people and respecting the dignity of every human being. This is not politics. True politics may be involved. This is not politics. This is, in fact, the holy work of God that we have vowed to participate in, that we have obligated ourselves to be God's agent of this holy work. Let it begin with us. Let it begin with us. May it be so. May it be so. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.